Welcome to Term Talk, the video podcast from the Federal Judicial Center that covers the Supreme Court decisions from each term likely to have the most impact on the lower courts. I'm Beth Wiggins, the director of the Research Division. In about the next 15 minutes, we're going to discuss Moody versus Net Choice, which was decided with Net Choice versus Paxton, and Linky versus Free. The Net Choice cases involve state legislation limiting content moderation by social media platforms, and Linky versus Freed, the use of social media by government officials. We'll discuss when speech by government of government officials infringes upon the speech of others in a different episode. So joining me today are Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean and Jesse H. Choper, Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of California Berkeley School of Law, and Michael McConnell, former judge on the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, and now Richard and Francis Mallory, Professor of Law and Director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford University Law School, and Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Well, so Michael, let's start with Linky versus Freed, which explores the implications of public officials using social media for both personal and professional use. Can you take us through the facts of that case? Uh, yes, this case involved an increasingly common uh, phenomenon uh, where public officials uh, use their own uh, personal accounts like a, a Twitter feed or a page on Facebook or uh, similar matters, both to express their own views, often to talk about their private uh, affairs, but also to make announcements about public policy, to defend public policy, and, uh, and to engage with the public uh, on the subject. Well, uh, this case involves one such official uh, named uh, James Freed, uh, he started a Facebook page back in uh, in, in 2008 uh, when he was just a private citizen, and it's filled with, you know, stuff about his, I, mean, I don't know, I haven't actually looked at his page, but <laughs> vacations and family and whatever, uh, personal stuff. Uh, and then he became city manager of his city in 2014, uh, added that position uh, to his page and began using his page also he didn't stop the personal uh, material uh, but he also used it to uh, talk about official conduct or things that they were doing defending uh, announcing uh, defending it uh, and and the plaintiff in the case Kevin Linke uh, was very critical of official actions especially during the COVID lockdowns and would make comments on the page uh, and uh, Mr. Freed uh, would remove these sometimes when he didn't think that they were helpful or he disagreed with them or thought that they were unreasonable or abusive or whatever. Uh, and then eventually Mr. Freed barred Mr. Linky from uh, commenting on the page uh, at all. And so uh, Linky then sues saying that the page was a public forum uh, that uh, to which he had a constitutional First Amendment right to participate without a discrimination on the basis of his point of view. And whether he could sue or not depends entirely on whether this page is state action or not, because the First Amendment applies only to governmental actions. So, Erwin, um, what did the Supreme Court decide and how did they reach the decision? Justice Barrett said, looking at the position of the individual isn't determinative. The fact that he was town manager doesn't mean that everything he does is state action. The court said the government officials have private lives and they've got free speech rights too. The court emphasized the need for a fact-intensive analysis. And the court articulated a two-part test here. First, did the individual have the authority to speak for the government? And the court said, quoting Luger versus Edmund Sewell, it must be, quote, fairly attributable to the state. And then second, was the individual purporting to speak for the government? And here the court quoted Blum versus Uratsky and said, quote, there must be a tie between the official's authority and the gravamen of the complaint. The Supreme Court said the Sixth Circuit stopped its analysis just by focusing on the fact that Freed was 
not being sued in his official capacity is being sued for his private social media page. This is a mixed use situation. And there has to be much more fact intensive analysis than that. The other thing that's interesting is towards the end of the majority opinion, Justice Barrett said, there might be a significant difference for First Amendment purposes between a government official blocking individuals from having access as opposed to a government official taking down particular posts. So Erwin, what are the takeaways from the decision for the lower courts? Well, I'm gonna start with the takeaway for public officials. If you don't want the First Amendment to apply at all, don't discuss government business on your social media. But I do think that there is a clear takeaway for the lower court and that the Supreme Court prescribes a two-part test. And I know that judges and lawyers love two-part and three-part tests, but I don't think this one gives that much guidance to the lower courts. It leaves so many questions open. First, how is we determine when somebody has the authority to speak for the government? Justice Barrett says, look at statutes, ordinances, regulation, custom, and usage. But as a dean, when, if at all, do I have the authority to speak for the law school? Do only the regents of the University of California have the authority to speak for the University of California? And second, when is somebody purporting to speak for the government? Again, to put it in personal terms, I write a lot of op-eds. Everyone states as a byline that I'm dean of the University of California, Berkeley. When am I purporting to speak for the government and how is a court to determine that? Okay. So Michael, anything else to add for the lower courts? Well, I, I would say, I think one of the interesting things about this case is that uh, it is almost a repeat of a much more controversial and publicized case uh, from uh, a few years ago involving then President uh, Donald Trump, uh, who, like Mr. Freed, had a personal page in which he expressed his own views on this and that, uh, but also uh, talked about uh, public policy. And Mr. Trump, like Mr. Freed, uh, excluded some critics. He would not allow comments and, and excluded some people altogether from commenting uh, on the page. And this case was headed to the Supreme Court uh, when it became moot. And I think one of the significant things about this decision is that it did not adopt uh, the way of uh, approaching the case that the Second Circuit had uh, in the Trump case, that the Second Circuit focused on whether the purported state action is something that the official could do only because of government authority or whether it was something that anybody would be able to do. Well, anybody can start a Facebook page or a Twitter uh, account, uh, that, that is not an exercise of governmental power. And so uh, the, the, uh, that, that divided the, the Second Circuit, but that's what they thought was most important. Note that the Supreme Court does not treat that uh, as a test. The real question here for the Supreme Court uh, is whether the uh, person speaking in the account is doing that on on behalf of the government. I think that's a much more plaintiff-friendly approach uh, than uh, the Second Circuit and other uh, uh, courts have been taking uh, in the past. Thank you. Well, so let's move on to the next case, Moody versus Net Choice. So the, the court heard oral arguments on both Moody versus Net Choice and Net Choice versus Paxton, where they issued one opinion addressing them both. Erwin, can you tell us what was at issue in these cases? Social media companies constantly engage in content moderation. Facebook takes down 5,000 hateful messages an hour. Florida and Texas each adopted statutes preventing large social media companies from engaging in content moderation and required to provide explanation when statements are taken down. NetChoice is a trade association its members include things like Facebook and YouTube. The federal district courts in Florida and Texas respectively enjoin these laws. The United States Court of Appeals, the 11th Circuit affirmed, finding the Florida law was likely unconstitutional, that it was regulating what private companies could put on their platforms. Mm -hmm. The United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit reversed the district court and said it would uphold the Texas law. It said, social media companies are common carriers and they get to decide for themselves what to include. 
the United States Supreme Court here reverses, remands to the lower courts, saying that here are the two circuits did not engage in proper First Amendment analysis for a facial challenge to a law. So, Michael, can you explain how the court analyzed issues in reaching that decision? Um, yes, Beth. The, there are essentially two almost completely separate uh, holdings uh, in this case. One is a holding and the other is technically dictum, but um, the procedural aspect of the case has to do with the distinction between as applied and facial uh, challenges uh, to statutes. This could be, this happens to be a First Amendment case, it could be uh, anything. And this distinction is one that's been with us for a very long time. Uh, but I think the court, the, this decision indicates that the Supreme Court is concerned uh, that uh, too many things have been treated as facial uh, uh, challenges. Uh, the court here is concerned, especially in a in, in a such a, a, a far-reaching, sprawling case as this. These two, the Florida and Texas statutes, are long. They're complicated. They apply to a lot of different platforms, a lot of different things. They can. Uh, they can be applied in a number of different ways. Uh, and the message of this case is that the litigants and then the courts uh, were just painting with too broad a brush, that we need more precision in the, uh, uh, in, in the constitutional uh, analysis. And now the other aspect of the case, which is on the merits, technically uh, the is is dictum. The the real question is whether social media companies are ed exercising protected uh, editorial judgment uh, when they engage in content moderation. Editorial judgment, you know, similar to what uh, newspaper editors or other uh, media do when they decide what to carry uh, and and what not to carry. Uh, and the answer is yes. Those uh, decisions are constitutionally protected they are expressive they're protect they're uh, uh reflecting the own uh the social media companies quote own views uh, and priorities justice kagan's opinion uh reflecting the views of six of the justices does uh straightforwardly <clears throat> uh address the actual first amendment merits of the case the three uh concurring justices and i think effectively were dissenters uh, on the First Amendment issue, we're actually quite angry at this. Erwin, can you tell us what the major thrust of those were? Justice Barrett said that this is something that shouldn't have been brought as a facial challenge, much better to bring it as an as-applied challenge. But she also clearly indicated that the 11th Circuit was correct in its analysis of the First Amendment, and the 5th Circuit got it wrong. Justice Thomas wrote an opinion that was quite stunning in that he said that he believes that facial challenges shouldn't be allowed at all. That would radically change constitutional law, not just for the First Amendment, but with regard to constitutional challenges to any statute or regulation. He also said that he thought that social media companies are common carriers, something the Fifth Circuit said, which means he would uphold the Texas and Florida laws. Justice Alito's opinion is the nominated concurring in the judgment, but it so had the tone of a dissent. He chastises the majority for addressing the desirability of the Fifth Circuit's opinion. He said the majority was saying it wasn't going to pine on the merits, but then it clearly did opine on the merits, and Justice Alito made clear he disagrees. What I thought was most stunning about Justice Alito's opinion, he said, that we shouldn't be applying traditional First Amendment principles to social media. So that they're different, and we need to develop different constitutional rules for them. Okay. Well, so in this case, like in Moody, the court said quite a lot about how the lower court should analyze the issues. Um, so, Erwin, just to expound upon that, what are the key takeaways for the courts? I think there are two. The first, as Michael said, is about facial challenges. In United States versus Salerno, the Supreme Court had said that a facial challenge requires showing no conceivable constitutional application of a law. But the Supreme Court had been much more permissive with regard to facial challenges in the First Amendment area. 
I think this is the Supreme Court saying it's going to be much more restrictive with regard to facial challenges in the First Amendment area. And I think that's important guidance for lower courts hearing such cases. And second, I very much agree with Michael that though the court said it wasn't deciding the constitutional issue, a majority of the just made clear that they think laws like Florida and Texas that prevent social media companies from engaging in content moderation are unconstitutional. Social media companies are private entities and they get to decide what to include or exclude. Mm -hmm. So Michael, what would you add for the courts? When you look at Justice Barrett's uh, concurring opinion, she identifies a number of different uh, questions that could arise uh, in the mm -hmm. uh, context of social media uh, uh, content uh, uh, moderation that aren't necessarily resolved by this general uh, position that uh, uh, editorial judgment is protected. So, for example, what will be the status of foreign-owned uh, social media companies like uh, like TikTok? That's there's a big case uh, going right now uh, about that. Um, what about uh, possible uh, other forms of regulation having to do with, for example, a greater transparency a notice? Uh, uh, and, uh, to users when things are being done uh, and why and that sort of thing, the, um, uh, the the opinion doesn't touch that. And so while I think that the big First Amendment question is definitively resolved, uh, there may still be uh, difficult questions coming to uh, lower courts in the future. Well, um, thank you both for being here today to talk about um, the these cases, and um, I look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.